the capital programs across this vast state and seen very first hand how a home can change someone's life, um, help them change their outlook, build their confidence and be able to look at some of the challenges over in the lives to come. My kids got a bit tired every time we went travelling, I'd be jumping underneath caravan parks and seeing what the mobile home you know, builder was or going past land parcels somewhere in some part of the state and, and, uh, and having a look at it. But you know, I'm quite proud to be able to show my kids in the past that as they go through that, you know, I've been involved in making some changes out in, in most of the parts of Queensland of what we've built and done. But today we're here again to talk about head leasing programs and how they've been used in the past and how they're currently being used in this tight housing market and also what are the opportunities that we can do something differently into the future. At its purest sort of uh, um, uh, aspect, a head leasing really starts as more of a commercial transaction between the, the lessee and the owner, lessor and the owner, between an organisation or the lessee to rent a property for the market rent and possibly some other costs that might be associated depending on the contract. Who then, you know, on, on does that to a tenancy agreement with a tenant to be able to either at market rent or at some sort of reduced rent. You know, depending on the lease, head lease contract, the owner may have still have a number of obligations for the property or those obligations are taken on by the, the lessee. There's been many variations that are out there on any given day of the week where you've got employers who are doing, doing work in country towns or in regional areas at the moment who are uh, head leasing properties for their staff to be able to complete that work. Um, there are investment models like the Defence Housing Authority which have been around for many years that provide that different investment or a model for the defence staff. You have local governments renting properties for its staff in, in, in communities and through the state government agencies such as Department of Housing and others, you know, who will either directly lease properties um, off the market or we also fund uh, a range of non-government organisations to be able to source and lease properties, mainly for use for various reasons for crisis, medium or, or long-term accommodation. Um, for the, the, the longer the term of the lease, obviously the more certainty for all and that though, however, does depend on funding streams and the future use of what the owner might want to use the property for. Now today I have three members from different states who are on the panel to talk about how we're delivering head leasing in their states and what it might look like in the future and be able to open up this conversation about this very important aspect. I have Harry Smith who is the head of the strategic initiatives of Haven Home Safe Haven. Uh, and works in a range of internal and external stakeholders to explore and develop initiatives that work to address homelessness and provide positive outcomes for people seeking stable and affordable housing. With over 25 years experience within both government and not-for-profit sectors, holding key leadership and governance roles across a number of programs, he brings a deep understanding of the various drivers and complexities underpinning homelessness and affordable housing. Welcome, Harry. I have Theresa Reid, homegrown CEO for uh, Mangrove Group of Companies that include Mangrove Housing, which is a Tier 2 community housing provider, Mangrove Realty and Mangrove Maintenance and Cleaning. Theresa is also founder of the Forgotten Women Project, an initiative aimed at providing housing for women over 55 who are experiencing a risk of homelessness. And in her spare time, she works as co-founder, as does as a Jack Reid Foundation, a not-for-profit organisation that delivers haircuts for homelessness. Welcome. And we have Re Rebecca Pinkstone, the CEO of, of Bridge Housing, uh, who leads a committed team of 100 staff providing housing services that change their lives. As more than 5,600 people live in some 50, 30, oh, sorry, 3,500 odd properties of Bridge Housing social and affordable housing programs across metropolitan Sydney. Before joining Bridge Housing in, in 2013, Rebecca worked for the New South Wales Government, a variety of senior roles to deliver major social housing and forms to improve services and growing the community housing sector. You'll see their bios on, on, online. So very much welcome panel members. Um, we've had a bit of a you know, conversation before. Each one's going to take a different perspective, which I think is great. Um, I always say to my staff, look at things through a different lens and then being able to look at all those lenses and see what can, you can get out of that and how we can make, turn things into the future. So Harry's going to kick off first with his presentation, then followed by Teresa and then Rebecca. They lined up nicely for me so I don't forget <laughs> and that. So welcome everyone and uh, I'll hand over to Harry. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'd also like to 
um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respect to elders past and present. Um, and it's great that we get to stand here and talk about the incredibly exciting, sexy topic of head leasing. It's kind of a step up from maintenance and just below evictions in the whole thing. Um, and I'm really, really surprised actually that so many people have turned up. Um, day three, last session, dinner last night. Uh, for those that went to the dinner and were uh, accosted by about 15 people standing there with trays of drinks, it turned into a very good night indeed. Um, so yes, talking about um, head leasing from our perspective, it's great actually with the uh, other panel members here, um, we've had a look at each other's presentations and we are taking uh, quite a bit of a different perspective. Um, as Mark said, I work for Haven Home Safe. Um, we are based in Victoria. Um, we're a homelessness organisation uh, that has housing options as well. So uh, we've been about 40 years in the making. Um, we've got about 2,500 houses uh, that we operate, own and manage on behalf, some on behalf of the department. But we are at our heart a homelessness organisation with entry points in Mildura, Swan Hill, Bendigo and Preston in northern Melbourne. So we get to see a whole range of different people from different perspectives coming to us. We are uh, kind of the organisation that has always taken the approach of, um, and, and maybe in hindsight a little bit too loosely, of we don't say no to anything. We have always uh, worked with government and other people to say, we'll give it a crack. We don't say no, we, we say why not. Now that's been a really good uh, model to be you know, really inclusive, working with a lot of different communities and a lot of different stakeholders. Uh, but you know, clearly the sector is changing and as a part of our journey with head leasing, which I'll step you through in a moment, we've, we've learned some really valuable lessons about we need to probably put a little bit more rigour into some of the processes and some of the tendering that we go through. And I think we've all probably learnt that as well. Not saying that we're reckless, not saying that we just um, jump in and do anything and jeopardise the organisation. We take a very um, strategic approach to everything that we do. Um, but things like, and for those who may have seen our CEO speak yesterday in one of the plenary sessions, um, Trudy Ray was talking about our um, response to the devastating floods this time last year throughout Victoria and particularly in Rochester. Government knows that they can come to us and say, all right, we need to sort this out. What can we do? And we'll say, yep, we'll get on with it. But we need to step back a little bit at times and say, there needs to be more of a commercial lens that we put through this. We deal with vulnerable clients. Client is at the core of everything that we do and everyone in the room would um, no doubt feel the same. But sometimes not taking as commercial a lens as what you can can jeopardise the client journey as well. And that's another learning that we're, we're all, I think, reconciling with. So I'll go through it. What I'm going to do is just, I'm, going to, I'm a bit of a storyteller. There's a, quite a few slides and there's a bit of detail on the slides, but I'm not going to talk to every point. I just want to give an idea of how our journey from the client perspective kind of worked out with this so-called head leasing model. It's been a long, long journey. So we first used head leasing for us for a program that we tended for and was successful as a part of um, uh, a response to vic supporting victim survivors of domestic and family violence. And it kind of worked through there. That was what we called our moving on program. And then we had this housing now program and a thing called home stretch and then targeted care packages and homelessness to a home. And I could go on and on. It's now stepping into uh, potentially supporting uh, prison release program. We've worked with male perpetrators of domestic violence uh, as a part of um, trying to help them work through their journey as well. And it has become quite a complex process. We'll start with moving on. This is probably our uh, most proudest uh, program in this area that we think has worked really well. Victim survivors, domestic violence. We structured the program. It was funded over five consecutive years and it grew every year. And so what we did is we uh, had this opportunity, this funding, and we're supposed to go out to the private sector and uh, private rental market and head lease some properties and then help the clients move into it. And pretty much every other agency in Victoria that took on this program got the funding, went out, procured all of the properties, head leased the properties, and then worked with the various support agencies to support the women to come through the program. And I say women, because it was predominantly women. I think of all the clients we had, there were two males that participated, but over the five years, it, it was all women for reasons I don't need to elaborate on here. Um, so the other agencies went and did that. 
But for whatever reason, I've actually tried to work this out corporately. And this is what I love about the organisation. I said, why did we do the model that we did? Because this was about a year before I came to the organisation. And I can't get a solid answer, but everyone I talk to says, it was my idea, it was my idea, it was my idea. And I love that. So people have taken real ownership of this. Essentially, though, what we did, we had the funding there, and then we started to work with the support agencies to say, well, what women, families do you have and who would be eligible for the program? And we recognised very early on that it wasn't about just getting in very early uh, when there's a lot of trauma involved. There's other agencies that do that and there's other supports around. But we said, well, what, what women do you know that have, have suffered trauma and still getting supported at the moment? And it's about moving on. And that's where we got our name from, moving on. So we had a panel set up and we would sit there and we'd read through the applications and some women would nominate to the program because they'd heard about it and other agencies would support their clients to come into the program. And then if we thought, yeah, this is good because it's about setting people up for success, we didn't want to set people up for failure. So then if they're accepted, we said, yep, we've got the money, you go and have a look at realestate.com, you find the rental that you want and that you think that you would like to potentially move into longer term and then we'll go and head lease it. And that's the way that it worked. So they would say, wow, this is fantastic. You've got to remember a lot of, uh, most of the clients, if not all of the clients, had lost their choice. They didn't have the opportunity to make decisions. They were dealing with that sort of trauma. So it was about giving them the space and the opportunity to reclaim their life and make a decision, uh, make, a, make a choice. Where did they want to live? Not some bureaucrat telling them where to live. Where did they want to live? And so we offered a discounted market, um, uh, a discount on the rent to them based on their income and we scaled it up over over the period of support that they had with the intent that hopefully in the end they could take on the private lease and that's a great outcome for everyone so we would step out they would have their property they've been there we'd help them establish a rental history and i think that was really clear as well you flee domestic violence you're on the lease you have had to go and your life is in complete turmoil and you end up being um, blacklisted because you're on the lease and rent wasn't paid and you go through vcat and so there's no way you can get back into the rental market so we really tried to support every single client that came through for success to be able to um, uh, move on with their life and reclaim their independence. 58 real estate agents participated in the program over the, the years. We, um, uh, 20 of those leased multiple properties, which was fantastic. So we went back to the real estate agents and we were able to lease multiple properties from the one real estate agent. So that's a fantastic success rate. Um, the, the agent said, look, this is working really well. What we essentially did, we'd go out, we would pay 12 months lease, and then we would sublease, and then the participant would pay us and we'd scale up the, her contribution over the period of time until she could take on uh, that financial stability at the end. Uh, 150 clients supported, 105 actually took over the leases, which was fantastic when I went back and had a look at the numbers, and 15 actually moved into social public housing, and then there were other things that happened as, as well, but they were the key figures. I should step back a little bit and say, why did I want to do this uh, analysis? Because head leasing in our organisation really became quite polarising, and I've got people who would say it's a great program and we should do more of it, and I've had people say this is a ridiculous program, we need to get out of it. And this is across a range of different areas between finance and maintenance and the tenancy managers. And so I wanted to just unpack the data and say what worked and what didn't work. So I'm not standing here saying I'm an absolute advocate for head leasing. I'll take you on the journey. I'll get to my assessment at the end. But that's where this came from. So in um, 150 clients supported, 105 stayed in the property. I reckon that's a pretty good outcome. During the COVID lockdown, though, particularly those of us in Melbourne within the Ring of Steel, it went pear-shaped in the last year. In that last year, we had three evictions uh, for rent arrears, two abandoned the property, five moved back with the partner, and a number we don't know what happened, they just essentially up and left. 2018 comes along, we go into this housing now one, this is supporting uh, homeless people in rural areas, clients again nominated, we went, hey, this other program's working, let's not just go and head lease 10 properties, let's see where they want to live. And so they were able to, again, go through realestate.com, have a look at where they wanted to live, they searched for the um, property themselves. We had nine real estate agents involved. This is in rural and regional areas. Ten clients were supported. Nine of them stayed in that private rental. So it can work. And one was evicted because obviously we're dealing with a client group that has uh, a lot of other complexities uh, in their life as well. 
Uh, moved into Homestretch, uh, started 2019. Um, I've given it a Homestretch name. It's actually the little names that agencies were funded for. Started in 2019, still current at the moment. This is where government actually funded a support agency. Uh, and if any of you got the chance to go and see, there's been two presentations on supporting young people, uh, one on Tuesday, one on Wednesday. If you went to it, you'll see what these organisations are doing for young people is extraordinary. Um, and if you didn't get a chance to see it, they've been recorded, go back and have a look at it. So we worked with two particular agencies, um, Berry Street and Wombat. They got the money to support the young kids. Basically, how it works, uh, multi-year program, the support agency supports these young kids coming out of residential care, and they identify them early. They support them before they turn 18, and then during the transition into independent living, and after as well. Fabulous program, because we forget, a lot of kids don't know how long you should leave chicken on the bench for, because they didn't grow up in a stable house. They don't know how to clean an oven. How do you clean a fridge? How do you cook? And so the support agencies wrapped these services around, which was fantastic, and then came to us. We would work with them. OK, young kids ready to move out. Where do they want to live? See the theme again? We would go and head lease, and we do that in a case-by-case -case basis. To date, 21 clients have completed the program. 11 are still in the program. Uh, 10 have stayed in the private house or moved in with their partner or with family or someone. Uh, two abandoned. We've had zero evictions. A really stable program. I love it. Then we've got this other program in the department uh, in Victoria as well. It's called Targeted Care Packages. Similar, young kids, same cohort. But these are kids that may not... And I'm going to call them kids. I actually changed this to young people, <laughs> trying to be politically correct. They're kids. And if one thing I've learnt from the two sessions I went to is uh, earlier this week, they are kids. And so they need support around them. These are kids that are in child protection, about to uh, exit resi care. They could be in really precarious housing situation. So the government designs this package, puts a package around it, comes to the sector, we're registered to be able to deliver it, and they will come to us. We will work with the support agency, again, on a case-by-case -case basis. It gets a little bit flaky, though. I've had phone calls from senior directors in child protection in a particular region saying, we've got a kid that turns 18 in three weeks, can you help us? How long's the kid been in the system for? Uh, since they were nine. And you only just realised now that they turn 18 in three weeks? So there's some teething problems. Nevertheless, we turn up, we give it a go, and we work with the organisations to try and support them. Uh, to put them into, again, some sort of a head lease. Uh, 24 participate, um, uh, participated. Um, one has actually been offered four different properties. They've sort of moved around the system because, you know what, young kids need the space to be able to move where they want. We're not about locking them in to live here in your forever home. Depends on where you want to live. Uh, 29 pack sorry, 24 real estate agents. I got that wrong, didn't I? One has offered us four properties to date. 29 packages we have been funded for so far. 15 have moved into some sort of long-term housing. Uh, one was incarcerated, one abandoned the property. Still not bad stats. Then we get to, and I can see my colleague sitting up front here, uh, Homelessness to a Home, a fantastic program that was set up in the middle of, uh, again, COVID. We picked up all of the people who uh, were living rough and we put them into hotels. 1,825 or 65, might have been 1,865 were identified in that process. We solved homelessness overnight in Victoria because we put them all in hotels. But then we went, what are we going to do next? We need to get them out. So the government funded this fantastic program of moving these people into some sort of housing. I had a good idea in the department. It was a bit of a uh, brain spark. We'll put, we've sort of got capacity. The department said to put half of those into um, public housing, but the other half, let's just head lease at the moment. Let's try and get some housing now principles, wrap around, and let's work out what we can do uh, to get them into some sort of a longer-term situation and... You know, Haven, you've head leased before, as with a few other organisations, can you guys go and head lease and let's work together on this? These are people suffering chronic homelessness. Now we've picked them up again and we've put them into the private rental sector. There was always going to be some very, very interesting outcomes indeed. We got funded for a couple of different areas, uh, in particular in Geelong and then in Benigo Muldura. Geelong was great. We had 61 clients. We managed to house them all in private rental. It took a while. We got there in the end. It was a new program for us. We wrapped the supports around them, worked with some uh, other agencies. In that particular one, 24 separate real estate agents participated. 16 offered multiple. They said, yeah, this is pretty good. One offered nine properties over the journey. Nine properties. 
There were two evictions, one abandoned. Bendigo and Mildura. Hang on, went a bit pear-shaped here because there was no rental properties. Everyone fled Melbourne. Everyone got out after the um, COVID restrictions were lifted and they went into the rural area. There were no houses to head lease. There was nothing. Only nine head leases were obtained in total. There were six in 2021, three in 2022. That was it. And we still had about 40 clients. We had nowhere to put them. Had Bendigo, at one stage, less than 1% uh, vacancy rate during 2021. It was difficult. Only one client stayed in private rental. We eventually moved all the clients. The department went and purchased property and we were able to move them into long-term housing. Some came into our vacancies as well. There's a summary. I just want to put the figures up. These slides have been made available. But this is, in summary, how we've performed. And I found this quite fascinating. 233 head leases is what we've had to date. 324 subleases. Because a lot of times we would sublease to multiple. Real estate agents involved, we've had 114 real estate agents involved that have wanted to partner with us, and that is terrific. How many of them had two or more head leases? 51 of them. Five or more head leases? 12. The RA, uh, real estate agent with most head leases, one had 11 head leases with us, and is still such an advocate for this program, wants to be a part, rings us up and says, I've got another property. Do you have any clients in any of your programs? Because we want to support you, which is fantastic. Um, how many were across two or more programs? So moving on, housing now, 23 agencies have been across multiple. One has been across four of our different programs. In the subleases, 287. Um, of the 287 that have concluded, 131 have remained in the private rental. 49 moved into public housing, 43 moved into affordable housing, and three moved into some sort of supported accommodation. It's not bad. 78% of people, by giving them a home, wrapping the services around, using the private rental market, we've had outcomes for. On the flip side, eight were abandoned, seven evicted, two moved into state, two incarcerated. And the other ones, we don't know. We record as not sure what happened. And that's been a bit of the learning that we've had and a bit of the failings. What are the overall learnings? As I summarise, head leasing is, um, it can clearly achieve positive long-term outcomes for clients, if done well. It allows them to gain independence, allows them to get a rental history, move on from social welfare dependency. If you can get people that don't go into social housing, isn't that a fantastic outcome for everyone, just by giving them the chance? Uh, work educational outcomes uh, for sta uh, have improved because of the stable accommodation. And we allow people to establish a lifestyle, but it's administratively complex. That's our biggest learning. It's very burden burdensome. Competitive rental market makes it really hard. We are getting out there to try to head lease with people. We have been having to apply for 15, 16, 17 properties at time for one person. Many applications, low rental availability, lease sign-off processes differ from agency to agency. It can be a bit difficult. We've got to get our CEO to execute the head lease. You're dealing with owners, agents, support agencies, maintenance people, we lose a little bit of control and we're dealing with a lot of different parties. What are the takeaways? One client equals minimum two leases. You are head leasing, you are subleasing. Sometimes you're subleasing multiple times. Don't have, underestimate the extra management that's required. Managing the real estate agents and the landlords is a specific skill set. Our tenancy managers work well with the clients. It was a new skill set to learn how to negotiate and manage rents going up the line for the head lease. Empowering the client to choose a rental property is key. That is the one thing we've found. We get them involved and we get, give them the choice. Uh, relationship management, one bad renter experience, we all have them, can really kill the relationship. You need rental properties in the first place. Support agencies have to be involved. And the big thing, head leasing is not a substitute. It is not a substitute for social housing stock. In our opinion, we have seen it work, but that is the key thing. It's an additional pathway to independence, but not something that government can abrogate the responsibility to push into the private rental market. It can work if it's done well. That's it for me. I shall pass over to my <laughs> colleague. I'm happy to be bridge housing. <laughs> oh, someone left their phone here. <laughs> That's all I 
Uh, good morning. My name is Teresa Reid, and occasionally I'm the CEO of Mangrove Housing. Um, I would like to acknowledge the First Nations people on whose lands we meet and view today. Um, for those of you who are here with a hangover from last night's dinner, I really am sympathetic to that. <laughs> Slightly sore myself. Uh, for those of you who are just hanging in for the end of the conference, I promise I'll be short. Um, to help with everyone's associative learning today, I'm going to talk about head leasing while we learn some fun facts which are useful at pub quiz about Monopoly. Hopefully this will work. The first fun fact is I'd like, is like all good ideas, Monopoly was originally invented by a woman and then it was stolen by a man. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, the original game was called the Landlord's Game and it was designed to teach landlords not to be greedy and exploit their tenants, which is incredibly different to where Monopoly got to. Um, so for me, it's a little bit actually like head leasing. Monopoly started out in one very different way to the way it's ended up and that's kind of our experience. So I'm going to talk a bit about our experience, but each one of us kind of incorporates everyone else's speech in terms of we do person-centred as well, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so I've concentrated on a slightly different bend to that. Oh, that worked, excellent. Uh, first, I'll talk a little bit about us. So we're Mangrove Housing. We're a tier two community housing provider, so I'm sitting in between two juggernauts. It's been fun. Uh, I would like to learn a lot from these guys. Uh, we have about 650 properties, but we head lease about 163 properties at any given time during the year. We spend $2 million on properties for head leasing each year. So quite a substantial number. A fun fact, the total funds in a Monopoly bank, if you've played Monopoly, is only 20580 bucks. That's the most you can make out of the bank in Monopoly, which is very close to what we spend on a property each year. <laughs> and it's very close to how much I need to pay a mortgage off each year. So just stick with that fact for a moment. Traditionally in Queensland, headlisting occurs within transitional housing programs. So there's quite a few and we deliver a lot of them. Um, just like the average game of Monopoly, it's only supposed to take about 90 minutes to play it. I've never played a game of Monopoly, it only took 90 minutes. Uh, transitional head leasing has increasingly become long-term head leasing. I've got some people in a two-year program that have been there 10 years um, because supply and a number of other things that we'll talk about. Um, some fun facts to help that sink in. The biggest, the longest game of Monopoly took 70 days to complete, uh, which is how long it feels when I play Monopoly with my eight-year-old. <laughs> Over. The longest underwater game, underwater game of Monopoly, I don't know how that works, was 50 hours. It's a challenge, Mark. While I'm a fan of head leasing, it's increasingly having less impact. I call it less for more. There's a number of reasons that that's happening, and lots of it is about we're propping up a supply shortage. So unfortunately, it's not having the impact that it should. Um, and there's a different set of clients that are now coming through head leasing than, than we traditionally had before. Our company was built on head leasing 30 years ago. We actually was one of the few programs that we did deliver. Um, so we've got a long history and, and like I said, I'm a big fan of it, but it's got to change. For us, head leasing in 2023 is a new game. So it's expensive for lots of reasons. First is that the rent costs a lot. Brisbane today is now the second least affordable city to rent in. Um, that's a huge change from the marketplace that we look at. Rent maintenance costs are astounding in terms of what has to, what has to be done to, to bring some properties back to the condition we want. And certainly the longer term we have the tenant in there, the longer likely that we'll have some maintenance costs done. Um, for us, head leasing, is becoming, our $2 million is going less and less. It's getting less and less from the marketplace. It's competitive. Fun fact, the least popular token in Monopoly is the wheelbarrow. Increasingly, we find ourselves feeling like the wheelbarrow when we turn up to ask landlords and places, uh, can we do head leasing? I was, I was telling my colleagues just before that I, I went to a meeting with a, a fairly large real estate agency that has lots of real estates across, lots of agencies across Brisbane. Four hours it took them to fill a property. They never even saw one tenant. They just took applications and went, that's the one that we want. Um, increasingly, we're not competitive in that market when we're talking with them. Um, much of what used to be attractive for head leasing isn't anymore because the marketplace is already meeting it. So guaranteed rent, great, there's full occup occupancy anyway at the moment. Uh, why take the risk on the wheelbarrow? You can have the shoe or the hat. I like the hat. If you haven't played Monopoly, this is really bad, sorry. <laughs> 
and really should. <laughs> um, it's no longer transitional or short term. And the benefits of the speed of being able to pick something up from the marketplace and the short term turnaround and, and the short term costs are gone because effectively now it's more like long term. I think head leasing works its best in a balanced marketplace. When you've got a supply shortage like we have now, it wreaks havoc on the way that this program can work best for us. A fun fact is a way to make the most money in Monopoly game is to own all four railway stations. I did not know. Interestingly, it's actually one of our strategies, and I'll talk about it in a second, about working with railway stations. Um, and that's about finding supply in new places. So for us, we've kind of adapted the program as we've gone along, and we've adapted to the marketplace. A monopoly game can actually be won in 13 seconds. I can't wait to find out where that fact's from and if it's true, and how do I do it? Because it will solve so many nights at my house. Um, so here I am with our 13 seconds of strategies. Uh, we focus our resources and our target on a specific market. So one of the things that we do in Brisbane, particularly if you're in, in, in Brisbane council area, you're about to be punished greatly if you have a short-term stay accommodation because you're gonna pay a lot of um, additional costs and additional rates. So we, we target those types of establishments and go, we'd like to head lease for a couple of years, thank you. Um, and we'll meet at a particular price point for them that's both saves them money and actually locks it in for us. And short stay is actually really quite nice accommodation. Um, we target a cohort sometimes. So older women, and, and uh, when Mark introduced me, he talked about it, we have a project called The Forgotten Women. It's a really easy target group to market to. Everyone wants to help older women. And so we find sometimes that's an angle into a lot of head leasing as an opportunity to say, look, we've got this one cohort that everyone believes is, you know, will be a fantastic tenant. And they are, which is great. Um, we target unusual supply opportunities like rails. Who knew? But everyone, all rail stations have a master's uh, rail house attached to them. So we target places like that and rent off places like Queensland Rail, like main roads who've repossessed homes for roads that won't be built for about a decade. So while it's short term, it's not really short term. So there's opportunities that we focus on there. We target developers. You build it, we'll rent it. I like to say that. Also like to target real estate to so go, you know, I'm a, instead of the wheelbarrow, we like to turn up and go, we're a $2 million customer. We'd like you to help us meet the need of what we've got here, and you only have to deal with me. So you've got all these economies of scale and savings with just having to deal with us. We also focus on prevention versus crisis intervention. So at the moment, and through our Forgotten Women program and for all the people from Queensland in here, I know the allowable expenditure rules. This is our own money. Uh, one of the things that we do is we do rental top up. So we don't head lease at all, but we go in and go, you're gonna lose your property if you're not getting an extra $50 a week, particularly with the older women cohort, and we top it up. So we have a deal with them to make sure that we can get them through um, because it's much harder to find her property when she's homeless than it is if we just kept her in it in the first place. So we've kind of changed the head leasing thought. We will get into head leases if they want, but usually we just want to keep what was already uh, happening still in there. Um, we would like to do investment versus expenditure, and I believe we're going to hear about how that might happen anyway. Uh, for, for my mind, $2 million is a lot of money. I've been in this job for eight years. That's $16 million. Hopefully my CFA says that's right. Uh, that's a lot of money that I would like to invest it in our own properties. One of the things that stops us at the moment is that we can't head lease our own properties, but I'm certainly happy to get a mortgage. Uh, and if we can head lease to ourselves, it's an opportunity for us to turn that that money that would have gone into the rental market into actual um, long-term asset. And a final fun fact, uh, the Parker brothers originally rejected the idea. They later paid 500 bucks for it and it's currently worth 1.4 billion. I think the lesson from Monopoly for me is that if you take a risk on some of the opportunities that you can have, you actually can win big in using head leasing. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, my name's Rebecca Pinkstone and I'm the CEO of Bridge Housing. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Yarriga people, and um, just really um, looking forward to the referendum and I'm very hopeful that we'll have a yes vote, um, but it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. 
Um, I'm going to talk about a head leasing program um, that we've had in New South Wales and, and Bridge Housing's experience, and I won't duplicate because my colleagues have really summed up the issues that we're facing in New South Wales as well. So I will be touching on some, I suppose, some different, different themes that have come up for us. So Bridge Housing is a tier one provider. Um, we manage around three and a half thousand properties um, in metropolitan Sydney. And obviously um, we've come to know what the rental market is like in Sydney. 1% vacancy rate, it was actually less than that. Uh, somebody was telling me on the weekend the rates are actually under 1% in Sydney. Um, we operate across metropolitan Sydney and the head leasing program that we administer um, has been a fundamental part of the way that social housing is delivered in New South Wales for over 20 years. And Bridge Housing is one of the providers that's always managed head leasing as a type of social housing supply. So we currently head lease 645 properties off the private rental market. Um, we have an annual leasing program of $13 million. And we have administered that program for over 15 years. So it's a permanent part of the system in New South Wales. And what it's really done in New South Wales has, has been providing an option for us in very, very high cost markets to meet individual needs. And in New South Wales, it's a little bit different to how it operates in other states. Our head leasing program has actually been a major vehicle for our housing first programs. So at the moment, we, we manage the largest um, housing first program, over 150 of our tenants that are moving straight from the street to home are actually based in head lease properties rented off the private rental market. So it's always been the type of program that has been a social housing long-term response, but we've particularly targeted different client cohorts through that. And, and Housing First, if anyone knows about Housing First internationally, head leasing is a big component of Housing First programs around the world. It's not all capital supply, and there's some reasons for that. But what we're really noticing is it is very complicated to manage a head leasing program of this size. We've got multiple relationships with real estate agents and owners, and um, we're seeing that we're actually facing, just like everyone renting in the private rental market, huge increases in costs across that program. So at the moment, we have a very good uh, relationship with my colleagues, DCJ, who fund this program. They tell us, Bridge Housing, here's $13 million, deliver 610 units in the private market. If you get any savings, you can rent more for people. And the reason that we've got a few more is because we, like other jurisdictions, have had ha uh, rapid responses to COVID and homelessness programs. So our head leasing is actually higher than our usual amount of 610 properties because we're responding to those home housing first programs that we've had in New South Wales. But it's really complicated to manage. It's lots of different relationships. And we, like everyone else in the private rental market in the last year alone, have had a 43% increase in the number of 90-day no grounds notices evictions that we're facing. 56% of our properties have had had rent increases. And if you look at that, that's double what we had last year. And 28% of those, pro those properties that we're picking up now are over the median rate in the, in the private rental market. And the way that we can manage this to the $13 million is because of scale. And I'll talk about some of the pros and cons now. So for us, head leasing is fantastic because it's quick. You can really go in, head lease a property and resolve someone's homelessness immediately. And it's really good because you can engage those people, particularly people who are moving straight from the street to home, in the process of selecting their own home. They engage in that program, they go to the property and you're there walking alongside them to select a property that meets their needs. So it's great in that way. It can really help us to resolve needs quickly. It's flexible and for us it's also helped us meet particular client needs that we can't meet in social housing capital supply, particularly around things like disability housing, um, where we need to have a particular need or where we have a woman escaping domestic violence that can't live in a, in a particular area anymore. You can really be flexible and, and, and make sure that that house meets their need in an area that suits them. 
Um, it also it also doesn't have the same issues around, um, I suppose, concentrated social housing, and it's much more of a salt and pepper approach. You're just living in the local community with your kids, um, and and you're able to engage in that area like you always have, and everyone in the private rental market is. But there's some real problems. The administration of the program is very complex. So we at Bridge Housing have the largest head lease program in Australia, and we've set a whole team up to manage our head lease program. And that's because it's very different to managing social housing. The people that work in that team are real estate agents. They're part of our not-for-profit real estate agency. They understand how real estates work. They help our team to negotiate the lease. They do end of tenancy costs and, and, and all of the costs associated with moving people out. They help negotiate that because it's a different skill set. We've also faced a lot of discrimination in the private rental market in our Housing First programs. And it's made us really think about what we head lease now. We do not go for head lease pro properties, for example, where there's a high proportion of owners who are strata. As soon as they find out that there's somebody coming in from, from homelessness, we've had you know 90 day notices issued. So we're really clear about where we use head leasing, the properties that we target and how we rent them to get the best outcome for that client. It's not as stable as social housing. On average, our social housing tenants move in and stay in, in social housing. At least two and a half times people move in the head lease program. So there's benefits, but they move two and a half times on average throughout their tenancy. Now, in New South Wales, we consider that to be stable housing. So, of course, we help that person move. But anyone that's been through the process of moving and relocating knows how stressful it is. Even when you've got a, a, a landlord walking alongside you and saying, we're going to make sure you've got another property. It's a hugely stressful experience and it's really expensive. It's expensive for us when we do the end of tenancies cost and it's expensive for our tenants when they have to relocate and set up at their new home. So it's not a cheaper option. It's actually more expensive than capital supply. One of the issues that our staff grapple with is we are actually competitors with low income people in the private rental market struggling to find a home. That's an ethical issue that we really struggle with and our staff st struggle with as well. Because it means that every property that we're picking up for someone we know, there's someone else missing out who would be able to access that home. And I would just say, I don't think it's value for money over time unless we really look at head leasing programs and how we're going to transform them to make them a permanent part of the system and think about what we're doing. And in New South Wales, I have to say that DCJ has been fantastic at thinking about this. How do we transform the head lease program? You know, we have $13 million. It's over $200 million, the head leasing program in New South Wales. How do we transform that to make it a better, better product for our tenants and also value for money for government? So, some of the things that we're thinking about at Bridge Housing is how do we use that leasing subsidy and actually transform it to capital supply? So what we're doing is looking at where we have those, the demand for housing in our particular areas and spot purchasing those properties in the city so that we can hold on to them for capital supply. And those properties there are all properties that we've bought off the private rental market. We use the leasing subsidy that we're getting from, from, from government. We combine it with our own funds and, and, and cheap finance and, and loan it, loans from NIFIC. And we've been able to transform now to 186 units that are now capital supply units held into perpetuity. The other thing that we're doing is saying, how do you transform it through institutional investment and impact investment? Because community housing providers are doing great work and we know that permanent housing creates great outcomes. So we're partnering with institutional investors who will purchase those properties, we will lease them and they will hold them for at least 10 years. So that means that we know that when we're moving someone into that home, we're, we're moving a family in, that they've got that home for for at least 10 years, maybe longer, depends on, on, on the property, but they've got it for 10 years, they can create that stability and they won't have to move. And so we're working in, at the moment with conscious invest, investment management. They've also worked down here in Victoria with um, Haven. 
to, to really look at how we can purchase properties and use that leasing subsidy so that we can create stability for tenants. So those are the things that we can do. I think we need to acknowledge now that head leasing is a part of our social housing system. We need to think of it like that. What are the policy settings we need to put around that program to create stability for tenants, to create value for money for government, and to make it really efficient for community housing providers to run? Thanks. Thanks very much, panel. And uh, as you can see, each panel member came from a different perspective about some of the work that's happening on the ground and how we could sort of potentially change the, the narrative on this over many years. I, I've always said to my staff, so, you know, we had a community rent scheme program. It was written by a bureaucrat in the 90s. <laughs> you know, like, you know, not me. I wasn't around there. Yeah. <laughs> well, I probably was, but no. But, but you know, the, the difference is, is that things can change. You know, like, just because that's what was world like in the housing market in the 90s or 2000 or even two years ago is totally different again yeah. now. So why would we expect that what we thought about and wrote about, that might have been good policy mm. in different years? And I think a lot of the you know, social housing arrangements. And I think there's another about what social housing is into the future, you know, how it's about helping those people on the lowest mm. ability to be able to get a housing and what does that look like. So we'll open up to an opportunity to have questions from the floor as well as um, hopefully uh, people online. If there's anyone virtually online, my staff are sitting here waiting to me to completely muck that up and not be able to, <laughs> to use the iPad, so I've got to prove them wrong. I'm on this great deal of stress about that. Um, but I, I suppose one of the convers first conversations about to have is this issue between relationship between owner and landlord and yourselves and how you see at the moment in today's world that you do build that competitive advantage to be able to work with owners and real estate agents. Um, in a different way, and are you seeing um, that changing with with owners and landlords? Any, each of you to comment about? Do you want to start? <laughs> uh, look, I, I think for us, it's both. I agree with what you were saying before about um, strata is is really painful, and, and individual owners. There's a lot of administration, and individual owners, and they are changing. But there's a real. It's my asset, and they have a real ownership over it, and and don't like some of the things in terms of, of renting it out. So um, I love dealing with the real estate. So I actually think that's a really economies of scale for both of us. And we actually have a good opportunity to talk about things we need to put into place to make that work better for the tenants and to make sure that everything's running smoothly for the owner and keep them quite happy. So I'm sorry, I'm looking at you because you did the speech yesterday. And I was thinking, <coughs> there's a very hard working property manager in the <laughs> audience. And I'm like, exactly, uh, where we can find efficiencies and similarities and, and make it work. So. And I think it's um, certainly the same for us as well. Um, the relationship is really interesting. I think, and being at the conference, seeing the different people that are, uh, have been involved from the private sector across a whole range. Like we've got investors here, we've got people from the department, there's people from the agencies. I think everyone's recognised that this, the current issues that we have right now is everyone's responsibility to be involved. And so we've found that a lot of owners want to step up. We started with the real estate agents obviously in, in moving on and we developed some really good relationships and people wanted to come back. The real estate agents have said, I've got some other owners, I spoke to them about it, they're keen to be involved. Go right through to our uh, homelessness to a home program and we said, look, we're really struggling in Bendigo and uh, again our CEO um, Trudy Ray was on uh, ABC Radio being interviewed and did a call out if anyone's got a property that they want to lease us. Um, let us know and we kind of went around the real estate agents and we had about a dozen homes uh, with people that came to us independently and said we've got a home uh, we were going to use it for this but we're happy to, to lease it. Where it on the flip side though there are some very opportunistic homeowners out there <laughs> who will say oh hang on so this is Haven Home so if you're an agent of government you must have billions oh your renter when you uh, shift it out completely destroyed it we're going to have to get the whole place repainted new kitchen and it's like yeah nah nah that's not going to happen like we are still you know we, we leased it we will return it to you in a leasable uh, process but we've had some interesting uh, legal conversations with owners about how far it should go. 
So um, I suppose I'm also interested in if you were the po if you had the chance to be the policy owner and, and make the change with the funding, what are some of the critical things that you would say would be the f things that, that you would say would, if you did these two or three things, it would help significantly change the dial and, on policy? So from our perspective, because we've got a range of programs and I'm looking at it purely through a program sense, if I was in charge of some of the policy, I would be looking um, at the particular programs. And I think the biggest gap that we have at the moment, I think where head leasing is great for enabling individuals to really reclaim that you know, personal responsibility. Uh, I think it's it's in uh, having better funding supports for young people. I'm going to bang on about that. I'm going to keep coming back to that because that's the big gap. I think at the moment there is a structural issue. Um, when you have a look at, I guess, quick calculation of 25% of new start allowance, I think is sweet FA. Yeah. I think is where it lands. We have. 25% of new start and we go and head lease and the young person wants to live somewhere for a period of time, yet who's going to pay the gap ongoing? And that's the issue, it's paying the gap between what the renter can contribute, if we're going to make this longer term, what the renter can contribute to we still have to pay uh, market rates back to the owner. So I think looking at that difference and I think the whole we need to have a more mature debate around the uh, no um, uh, no reason eviction in Victoria. We adopted that uh, 2021. The 120 day notice to vacate was removed. You need very specific reasons now to uh, evict if it goes on to a periodical lease beyond the, it can be 12 months or 18 months. What happens then? If you're approaching the end, then it becomes very difficult. Uh, and so the easy option is to say to the client, I'm sorry, we're going to have to finish this lease because we can't get into a situation where we're going to be carrying the lease longer term. And that, in some cases, is re-traumatising a cohort who thought that they had a little bit of housing stability. So the funding gap and who's responsible for it would be the policy I'd be looking at. I mean, I think in New South Wales, um, and it's not just because um, my colleagues are here, <laughs> they have done a fantastic job in rethinking how head leasing works. Um, it's not seen as, an, as a sort of one-off program. It's part of the social housing system and it's got its own policies around that. Um, and that's the reason we've been able to leverage finance into the program is because we can say, well, we can guarantee you at least 10 years that we will be head leasing these programs from you, uh, these properties from you. Yeah. Um, I would like to see it increased to beyond the 50% threshold it is at the moment. So at the moment, you can only borrow up to the capacity of 50% of your portfolio head lease. Um, I'd like to see that extended in recognition of the fact that it is a permanent part and then um, it enables community housing providers to make some of those judgment calls around purchase and finance because you know that you have that income source coming through in a guaranteed way. So I think we've got it there. It's about increasing those policy frameworks at the moment to encourage that in investment and different ways of working. Brilliant. Oh, I want that. <laughs> uh, no, I echo, echo that in terms of I think that's that's a discussion here in Queensland that, that we need to kick off and look at. I, I hate, I'll put it really simply, I hate dead money. Yeah. And, I, and I like the thought of we can convert some of that in, into, into assets um, within boundaries. I also think part of it is some of... Programs are great, except when they create boundaries that then can't shift as the marketplace shifts. And I think some more flexibility in that, uh, where you can do different things, and including using top-ups and things like that, gives us more of an opportunity to be able to use it more efficiently at the, at the moment. Um, at the moment in the... Yes, down there, yes? Sorry, I'm part of the Um, I like to hear from the panel because we manage over 3,500 properties in the private sector. It is not really, we cannot really choose our clients. It is really demand driven. I like to hear it from you guys. How do you manage your tenant damage side of the you know, matters and how do you monitor how the tenants actually looking after the place? Um, how do we? Um, so, so we manage it like a social housing property. So that, I mean, we, 
our, our housing managers are in the properties in the same way. We do the property inspections with the real estate agent and our tenants, and we're often out there. So for example, for our Housing First programs, um, that's more than once a year, that's every three months. So you can pretty well see where things are going off. Um, but I have to say that scale enables you to do something a little bit differently and, and more cost effectively. And, uh, and I think that, um, so, so you, you don't get caught up in, you know, sometimes you will have a spectacular failure of a housing first client in a, in a head lease property. And, and you have to then bring that property up to standard and, and do that. But overall, we don't have the, it's, it's comparable to our, our social housing dwelling because it's part of the way that we manage the property. So I think you have to, you have to build it in to the way that you call, you manage your portfolio as a whole. And we're, we're the same, exactly the same. We, uh, there's no difference between the way we manage a head lease property to uh, any of the properties that we own. Um, in fact, it, it, dealing with different real estate agents, it's been, I think, an eye-opener on, on both sides. The sector, the, the community housing sector is a lot more advanced than what people think. I'm not talking about just having, I'm talking, you know, preaching to the converted in the room. We don't just have, uh, it, not every client in our portfolio has these, you know, tremendous trauma based issues and all the rest of it. They're just people just trying to live, just trying to get on. But we have a lower ratio than what I've seen in the private rental market. I think tenancy managers there can be anywhere from one tenancy manager to 250 properties. I've heard some site up to one to 300. We do this at one to 30. Uh, sometimes one to 60. Um, so we will have one tenancy manager will have no more than 60 uh, in this program, no more than 60 clients. Most of them will only have 30. So you get to know your renter very well. In terms of then, if something does go wrong, you've got a support agency. And of course, we have a maintenance budget as well that we will manage it. But it's then incumbent upon us, we get a limited budget for maintenance. So we have to do the right thing and make sure that we put strategies in place to mitigate risk of damage to the property. Okay. We, we do might. both of those things exactly the same. Down the front. Yeah. Uh, property manager. Oh. <laughs> Hi. Um, on the subject of risk, a really good timing. So my name's Laura. We um, I own and operate a uh, agency in Brisbane. Uh, we manage uh, almost fifteen hundred rentals. Um, so. Firstly, I'm a really great proponent of head leasing. I've been a promoter of it for quite some time. I think it's a really great idea and I really love seeing the success that you guys have had. I do want to say though that we have had success but then we have had some failures. Uh, perhaps it was the agency, the company we were dealing with, no one up here. <laughs> Um, so they didn't turn they didn't turn out very well, and there was no bond. Part of the agreement was no bond, and um, and I thought, well, that's okay because the government's backing this, and so we we convinced our landlords, you know, please take this on two year lease, nothing to lose, great. They didn't last two years. We had no bond, and basically the company just said, there you go, have your house back. And I do want, like, nothing to do with you guys, but I just want to say that there's a lot of things that are happening that are, are not quite what they seem. But my big issue is landlord insurance. Now, in Queensland, I don't know about other states, a uh, landlord insurance company regards this as subletting, and subletting is not covered. So in the instance that we had that it all turned to custard, we couldn't even go to the landlord insurer. So, I don't know, I'm just throwing a spanner in the works here, but it's a big deal because that's the risk mitigator, you know, to have that landlord insurance in place for loss of rent and damage by tenants. So, I just want to see if you guys have had any experience in that. Is that a, a factor in all of this? And, and it's a real factor for landlords and for us who are putting our names on the line to uh, encourage landlords to um, be part of the program. It, uh, look, it definitely is a factor for us. Um, tremendous example you've given. Uh, uh, and, and look, for us that does happen and we do have a tendency that goes to custody and, and sometimes it can be an astronomical bill. Um, for us, it is about managing before that happens, I guess, and part of it is we are guaranteeing we will turn it into a livable state. So irrespective of 
it's not government funding, unfortunately, it's our fund, and like in terms of, of where it's coming from, because you're still spreading across that grant and, and that rental income to do it. Um, but yes, we don't see it as a, as much as we want our landlords to have the insurance, it doesn't mean they can always claim on it. Yeah. And we acknowledge that. Uh, we haven't had as much of an issue around that because we do underwrite. So, so, so we do have cheeky landlords and owners who would like us to do things which are over and above um, the standard at which the property was let to us. But uh, uh, overall, we, you know, uh, having seen real estate agents and social housing, I don't think there is any difference between. Um, the way that we manage that, that property versus how it is in the private rental market. You will have spectacular failures in the private rental market as well. I think the thing about a community housing provider is most of the time you're trying to maintain the relationships with the real estate agent. Um, wherever possible, we try to hold on to the property. So it mightn't work out for that person. They might need to relocate for whatever reason. We try to hold on to that lease to reduce the churn and the turnover and put somebody new in there. And, and then with those, those costs in between, we do the work ourselves as part of our own business. So we, uh, you know, I think it's like anything. You will get operators that aren't doing it effectively and you will get ones that do. Um, but we, we treat that property you know, if we're holding it for a long time, we will make sure that it's up to standard in between tenancies. And, and we're often we don't even have to go back to the real estate agent. We just manage it ourselves. Yeah. yeah. And we're, we're the same. Yeah. I kind of feel compelled that I have to apologise on behalf of all communities. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, I think it was a bad Who experience. was it? Name names. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, oh, damn, it's me. <laughs> we, so our relationship would be, we will come in and we will say, we have this client, we don't say the program, could we lease this property, you find a property, we'll give you six to 12 months rent up front. And you go, oh, hang on, so your rent's covered. And then we'll say we'll return it, at, um, you know, if there's an issue, we'll return it at a leasable level. Yep. Um, we'll still say you need to have, the builders need to have builder's insurance. Like if it burns down, it's not on us, we'll get it back to letable, but we're not, we're not gonna go and rebuild yeah. a property if something happened and there was a fire. So don't think that we have deep, deep pockets and we'll do everything, but we'll get it back to you. So, sorry. <laughs> Stick with it though, it's worthwhile. So we got, a, we got one down the front there, and then we've got a couple in the front here, I think also wanna do it. So, that gentleman down the back. Hi there, uh, John from Shelter. Just wanted to ask anyone on the, on the panel, I don't know this, and if and I think I should, and if I don't, others in the room may not. What's the extent to which the lease program applies to affordable housing products as well as social housing? It doesn't apply it doesn't. to affordable housing in New South Wales. I'm trying to do more with the subsidy. Is there an opportunity there for us to be able to you know, flesh it out a bit and say we could achieve a lot more if we're targeting at the key worker you know, traditionally discount to market or less of a subsidy than we provide for social? Is well, there I mean, yeah, it would be less of a subsidy, wouldn't it? Because you're looking at the rent. Uh, the reality is, like, we don't have enough social help. The 57,000 people on the waiting list in New South Wales, mm -hmm. where's government's effort and investment going? My view is it should be in social housing and the pointier end. Um, so, so, you know, these products can apply for social affordable housing because effectively what government is doing is just making up the difference between what the tenant pays and what you're renting it off. So, yeah, it would, it would, it would reduce that, um, but I think that we can focus on more efficient ways of driving efficiency for social housing outcomes before we worry about affordable housing through that program. Okay, I think we've got Lady yeah, hi, Andrea Sharon from RMIT. Now, I'm going to get in trouble with a hurry by speaking about a current project that's not published, so looking at head leasing. <laughs> and one of the things that we will certainly be recommending is around how to make it a more institutional product and how to aggregate and make it a much more sort of sustainable and broader program. So I think Rebecca we should have a conversation. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I would like to alert people to, I've 
put this postcard here. There, we have a specialist asset management manual for social housing providers. It has a chapter on head leasing. So it sounds like some providers might need a bit of help. <laughs> <laughs> and that chapter is going through an, an update. So I recommend yeah. people get a hold of that. But what I'd like to know from you is you've got a sub subsidy stream, which is largely about the income gap. Yeah. What about the make good provisions? We heard from providers who regularly were paying $40,000 in make good because of the particular cohorts they were housing. Yeah, um, I think that I haven't heard of $40,000. Um, but uh, so, for example, um, end of tenancy costs um, under the leasehold program would be about $2,500 across our program. Um, and so, but having said that, they can be spectacular failures as well. But I think that's the scale and the way that we manage that program at Bridge Housing. Um, we're, we're, if you're a smaller provider and you've got a head lease program, it, you know, it, it is a higher risk for you because you can't mitigate that in any way. You've got, you've, you've only got that money. Um, so, so I think, yeah, absolutely, it has been. And for our Housing First cohort, it's been a much higher program. So, under the New South Wales program, technically, you have about eight hundred dollars end of tenancy cost. That, that's theoretically for your head lease program, um, but yeah, on average, ours is two and a half thousand dollars end of tenancy cost. So it, it, that in, in no way meets that. Yep. I, I, I would add to that that I think we worked ours out recently and as a smaller provider it does bite at us a lot harder. It is difficult to make it a sustainable program if I think we're two seven but that means we've got some big whoppers and some that weren't. Yeah that's right. Um, and it's yeah it's it's even down to cash flow and things like that so it is it is a complex one to do and with rising maintenance costs it's getting more complicated yeah. because simple things cost a lot more than they did before. Yeah. It's economies of scale um, definitely we have a, a pool so if we've got 150 in a pool there'll be two and a half thousand you put it in um, may not spend it all um, it is amazing what an unsupervised young person can, can do, do with friends <laughs> over a long weekend in a high rise. So oh, it was you. We... <laughs> it was him. Have you, been, uh, have you been looking at my son? <laughs> so, uh, so we did hit a $40,000 repair bill. Um, it just happens. Um, they're very rare. Um, and you've got to try and have insurance your own to mitigate against that. Uh, institutionally, though, looking at it, I think this has the capacity to do it at scale. Um, particularly, I think uh, defence housing do it extremely well, where if we can get people who want to tip their house in and, and offer to uh, have a 20 year lease model um, and get it slightly less and you know, cap it so it allows us to reduce that subsidy, so we can hit the supply side and bring down what's being offered, and then we can bring it up and put the right government sponsored. But, sorry, I'm pointing to someone in government. I shouldn't do that, but you know, sorry. Um, if we can get that, meet that subsidy, and then it's incumbent upon us. We're the third part. This is a, a tripartite agreement. If we can then work internally to make sure that we support the renters to mitigate risk against damage, it's a. I think it has a potential mm. to be a good market. Yeah, not I a mean, substitute. Two hundred and ninety million dollars in New South Wales. Um, Tara outlined three and a half thousand in public housing head leasing itself. Um, what you, you we're, we're doing obviously that partnership with Conscious Investment Management, um, Housing First in Victoria have a, have a similar sort of program. But yeah, you, to think about that, aggregating that, that as a program, I think there's huge potential to do that. Mm. Because you, we've already seen that most of the um, key worker affordable housing models are about hold for a period of time and sell. That's, what, that's how they cross subsidise the program. Um, so if you'd have to think about that from a programmatic approach so that you're not getting to the 10 years and everyone's selling up and where are you going. Um, but there's huge potential to do that, I think. Okay, we've got a call in the front here and then there's, there's one down the back after that. Good um, afternoon, uh, Michael August from DCJ um, Housing uh, in the Community Housing Branch. Beck, um, thanks for acknowledging um, your funding um, department. <laughs> Uh, but also, um, uh, in terms of the flexibility that has been built into the program, so way back in the um, in the distant past, uh, stamps used to be counted in terms of um, providing money to um, community housing providers. Now it's block grants, yeah. and the guarantee that you've um, mentioned, which has led on into the conscious investment, the question is. What savings have you um, seen in terms of either resources or cash that's come out of that um, uh, 
relationship with conscious investment? Well, um, nothing at the moment because we were awaiting approval uh, for our SPV from the registrar. Um, but um, we, it's exactly that. So under the agreement with conscious investment management, we are going to do, we operate in some ways like a real estate agent ourselves, right? But we're head leasing from, from we're, we're managing the properties ourselves. So we're cutting out all of those sorts of administrative issues that we save. So we think that we'll save administrative dollars. Um, and at the same time, we're also getting a management fee from conscious investment for those properties. So that will be managed through our private real estate, uh, not-for-profit real estate agency to sort of congregate that. Um, and so I think it's more around the administration and, and, and um, saving money in that way. Because as you can see, there were 400, 400 different real estate relationships. We have 50 owners, direct relationships. That's very administratively burdensome. So just dealing with one investor with 100 units is, is much easier. And we know that we've got them for 10 years. So the churn for us is a big issue. The, the, um, as my slide showed, you know, notices of termination, that's the most costly. Wherever possible, we try and hold on to that property for a long time because the cost is in churning through the program. Agree. So we will be. We have a little evaluation plan for it, Michael, and I will keep you posted on how much <laughs> that <laughs> we're saving. <laughs> but I will say to John's point, um, what we have done, so so because we have a not-for-profit real estate agency, Home Ground, and we've got a tax ruling now through Home Ground Real Estate, so that owners can lease their property through us, and if they lease it at below market rent, they then claim that amount as a charitable deduction at the end of the year. So through that program, we've now got 50 different properties that are, the, in effect, are affordable housing because they're below market rate. And, um, and that's being subsidised through the tax system. It's got nothing to do with the State Housing Authority. It's completely mum and dad investors who want to make a difference through their po property. So I think there's some ways that you can look at different things to intervene in the market and having a focus on real estate and, and that sort of um, uh, mentality in terms of how you manage properties and how you think of it. I think you can drive some efficiencies there and create some better housing outcomes because the states and the, and the Commonwealth aren't contributing to that housing at all. It's just done through mum and dad investors who want to make a difference. Okay, I think down the back. Question. Oh, don't ask them. It's my staff. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> make didn't get Sorry. At all. Yeah, they I'm haven't heckled yet. It's not going to happen. <laughs> 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 no, so um, we currently have someone full time um, working on actually trying to sign up new head leases. Uh, however, there is sort of a massive stigma on um, people um, in relation to social housing. Mm. Um, we are only one company um, with obviously many other CHPs across Queensland. Um, is there something more that can be done um, as a whole to actually? Um, increase, I guess, the, the social housing stigma? That's a good question. That's a, that's a great question. Do you, want, do you want to answer for your stuff? Yeah. <laughs> your promotion's still not happening. <laughs> Far out. They'll try anything. I think um, it, it's having these conversations, mm. having these conversations right now and, and keeping the conversations going that th there is a stigma and there will always be a stigma. I don't know how long it's going to take to break through that. I think we're all you know, looking at the, we're putting our responses into the National uh, Housing and Homelessness Plan. I think a key part of that could be we just try and just change the narrative. We need to lift the narrative. But why is it a stigma here but it's not in some Scandinavian countries? We need to get through it. But then I think when we get situations like what was called out by the uh, colleague earlier, that, that just undermines it for everyone. That sets it back. The relationship management of one bad experience, and in that case I would say it's not even really the, the renter, it was the agency, it just puts us all back. So I think mm. it's about recognising that we lift uh, and we all step up. We do some amazing things. I think that's not recognised by the sector. We focus on the renters that we're supporting, but we need to also lift and the discussion around how good we are. As a sector, we are really, really good, but we don't promote that. So we kind of go into with the privates and we say, oh, could you please help us? And sorry about the stigma. No, apologise. We're making a difference. We've got to continue to make a difference. And we've got to just claim that we are good and own that space and demonstrate it. I agree. I think we're one of the few sectors that 
we don't promote ourselves, which is weird because we promote everything else, but we don't promote the good stories. And I know some shelter people are potentially here and I'm always, we've had a minister come and talk about, she's from social housing and there's so many great stories out of social housing. I think it would be a great opportunity to market that by the way, it does change lives and it makes a difference. And yeah. it's a completely different set. Jonathan Thurston's from social housing. Like there's some great examples as opposed to the horrible story. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we need to shift the dial. The reason that there's a stigma is it's a tiny percentage of the housing market. Less than 4% is social housing. And to get into social housing, you have to be the most disadvantaged in society. And um, we're really limiting who can go into social housing. So it's not, for me, it's not a surprise that there's a stigma there because actually our government's policies have driven that stigma. Um, but I will say the reality is that the majority of people who get Commonwealth rent assistance are on a Centrelink payment and get Commonwealth rent assistance live in the private market. They're social housing residents in all the tets of purposes. They're the people we're housing. The majority of them never get to live in social housing. They're just struggling in the private rental market. That's the reality. So I think we need to get back to the reality of who's living in, in our properties. I think we can market ourselves better, but what we need to do is radically increase the supply of social housing and, and affordable housing and as a proportion of the market so that we can get to places where it's not such a stigma anymore to live in social and affordable housing that's managed by the government or a community housing provider. Good point. We may have time for one more question, I think. Um. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks to the panel um, for sharing. Um, uh, Michael Pugh from St Patrick's over in Western Australia, um, like Haven but much, much smaller. Um, we're a homelessness organisation that does community housing. Um, back before COVID, uh, we embarked on a, a very modest experiment in head leasing connected uh, with housing first, then COVID happened and that got really interesting. Um, we, we did achieve some good outcomes, but one of the um, challenges in particular for us is that the subsidy available to us from the state government only lasted for two years. So I'm quite interested, Rebecca, uh, particularly in your context, um, how the funding works uh, from your state government? Yeah, so we're in the same boat. So Together Home, which was the New South Wales government's response to, to um, COVID and housing first and homelessness, that was originally two years. And part of the part of the commitment by community housing providers, and there are a number of them from New South Wales in the room today, was that we were to find exit options, i.e. transition into our either our mainstream um, uh, CHLP leasehold program or social housing. So it was time limited. Um, what we have found though, because we've got such a large program is that, um, that we, can, we do have the vacancy that enables us to be able to absorb those properties within our portfolio. For smaller providers you don't, it's a huge risk. I would warn, warn providers that are small not to not to embark on head leasing programs without really talking to someone that administers it. It is more expensive for you to manage a head lease program, particularly for housing first clients than than um, social housing, absolutely. And you don't have anything to manage that risk. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, any last burning questions someone we've got? No? We're done? Okay, well look, thank you very much panel. I think that for everyone, everyone could congratulate them for the <laughs> I hope you might be able to take that back to your organisations and have a think about that and talk to your respective government agencies. No, Theresa, you're okay. Yeah. <laughs> See you after, Mike. <laughs> yeah. um, and look, you know, our dinner will be available on the lunch we'll be there, uh, with it. Um, thank you very much for attending the session and I hope you have a rest of a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. I'm going to be in trouble for it. Yeah, no, thanks.